All right, well, um, let me read a, um, a portion of 1 Corinthians 13. I believe I have uh, verses 8 through 12 um, listed in your bulletin. And I think you're very familiar with um, 1 Corinthians 13. It's talking about the, uh, the charismatic gifts. And it also talks to us, of course, about the importance of, of love and how if we seek to do anything for the Lord, if there isn't love, if that's not the motive, then it's meaningless to him and actually worse than meaningless. It's uh, actually offensive to him. So we do need to have love, but then it goes on to talk about these great gifts, but how much greater love is. And of course, the fact that these gifts are going to pass away, and we believe, um, at least in this particular camp, theological camp, that those gifts that are being referred to there of knowledge and prophecy and so forth, tongues, have already come to an end. But then it looks beyond that to the perfection of heaven, where, of course, everything that is only partial will then be made perfect. And that's what we want to consider this evening, how love is perfected in heaven. So this is what Paul writes. He, goes, he says, love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But again, I think, again, the perfection of heaven includes everything, uh, not just the knowledge, but also the love. So we're looking this evening at love perfected in heaven. Now, as we've been looking through these various arguments, I, I think I spelled them all out this morning, so I don't want to spend a great deal of time reviewing them this evening, but let me just simply say this, that we have seen how the Spirit of God worked in David and in Paul, and though we don't often think about it, also how he worked in the Lord Jesus Christ with regard to his human nature. Uh, he operated the same way that we do, essentially. He was filled with the Holy Spirit above measure, and so he was filled with a perfect love. He was perfectly sanctified by that Spirit. The Spirit of God gives to his people a heart that loves what is good and right. And again, we see that perfectly uh, uh, exhibited in our Lord Jesus Christ. So that is the Spirit's work. That is his ministry. That is how he gives us the power to believe by giving to us a love for that which is good. We trust in Christ. It's also how he transforms us into Christ's image by creating and strengthening this love in us. And let me just remind you what we saw this morning, that he doesn't do this when it comes to growth in love. He puts that love in our hearts, but with regard to growing in that love, that requires effort on our part. We do have to do the hard work of pursuing this love. But this evening, I wanted to finish Edward's argument that true religion, that which God gives to us through faith in his Son, is all about the Spirit's ministry of love in our hearts. And I want us to see that by looking again at the goal of that love. It's perfection, you know, looking at heaven. As Edwards would say, that's where we see true religion in its purest and most perfect form in heaven. And there we see that heaven is a world of love. But before we get to that point, I just want us to think of a few things or look at a few things about heaven. Okay, first of all, I want us to consider what heaven is. And again, remember that um, there is, you know, th this is meant to be an encouragement to us because this, again, is our destination. Well, simply put, we know heaven is where God dwells. David writes in Psalm 11, verse 4, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is 
in heaven. You know, we think about that true temple that um, is, is not like the earthly, or the one that the earthly, um, the earthly temple was patterned after, the one which is in heaven. So heaven is the temple of the Lord. But heaven is also the throne of God. You remember in the temple, there's the Holy of Holies and there's the mercy seat, and that's the throne of God. It's like a, a picture of heaven. So heaven is where God dwells. Solomon writes this as well in Ecclesiastes 5.2. Do not be hasty in word or impulse in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God, for God is in heaven, and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Now, again, that's not surprising to us. We, we usually think of God, when we think of Him, we think of Him as being in heaven. And that is interesting because we also know the Bible says, you know, the heavens, the highest heavens cannot contain the Lord. God is infinite. God is everywhere. And so we have to think about what sense He is in heaven. And I think what we need to understand is this, that though God is everywhere, God reveals Himself in all of His glory in heaven. Uh, for the angels to behold and they veil their faces, for the spirits of righteous men made perfect to uh, to see the Lord in heaven, which is our, our greatest blessing, as we know, the beatific vision, that's where he reveals himself, so much so that God is said to dwell in heaven. But let's not forget, as we were reminded this morning, that he is uh, very much here as well. There is no place where he is not. Now, perhaps we've thought that that's how it's always been. Okay, that God has always lived in heaven, that heaven is his eternal home where he has always enjoyed fellowship with the other members of the Trinity, his Son and his Spirit, and where the holy angels have always dwelt with him. But we should see or rem remind ourselves that this is not the case. Heaven is not eternal. Heaven is a part of this creation just as the angels are a part of this creation. Uh, one, you know, one of my Old Testament profs, as he was seeking to explain you know, the origins of heaven, believed that, that Moses tells us that heaven is actually created within the creation week in Genesis 1, verse 1. And let me just uh, give you a little bit of that argument. Uh, Moses writes there, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this Old Testament prof didn't believe that the heavens referred to in verse 1 were actually referring to the starry heavens, but to the place where God would dwell with his angels and where mankind would eventually have joined him and certainly where the redeemed will join him. But originally, God created heaven for mankind to join him after the work of multiplying and subduing the earth had been completed, that is, of course, if man had not fallen. Now, the reason he believes this is because after verse 1, Moses goes on to describe how the Lord orders the earth or how he arranges the earth in those six days of his ordering. Okay? Um, now, Let's see. Um, well, let me just put it this way. He, he goes on to say, I guess I deleted that verse I was looking for. Um, he goes on to say, now the, the, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was on the surface of the deep. And then the Lord said, let there be light. And then we know he goes through the six days where he takes what he creates on day one, the heavens and the earth. Uh, he takes the earth and he begins to shape it and order it in the way that it will eventually become as we see it today. But we also understand from Job 38 verses 4 through 7 that the angels were there to see that ordering. Okay, let me read to you what he says in Job 38 verses 4 through 7. Job, or excuse me, God says to Job, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements? Since you know, um, or who stretched the line on it, on what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone, when the morning stars sang together, 
and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Okay, the sons of God here are the angels. And what God is telling Job is that the angels witnessed the creation, which means they must have been present for that. And they would also need a place to be uh, in order to watch what it is the Lord is doing. And I think that that somewhere it was heaven. Now, it's also true, I think, from what Moses writes in Genesis 2, verse 2, that God created the angels along with everything else within those six days. Listen to what he writes in Genesis 2, verse 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. So again, the idea is God originally, when he creates, he begins by creating heaven and the angels, and he creates the material that he's going to form the material universe into over the next six days on day one. And then, you know, he creates or orders the rest of everything, but the angels are there in heaven in order to see these things. So again, what is heaven? Heaven is the place where God dwells in all of his glory. Heaven is the place that he created at the very beginning. It's a part of this creation, and he created it to be a place where he would dwell with his angels but also where he would eventually receive us. Now, second, let's ask the question where heaven is. Now, it does appear that after God created the heavens and the earth, that they were at first connected together. God says uh, through Ezekiel to the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28, verses 13 through 16, and again, I think you're very familiar with this passage. He's speaking to the king of Tyre, but he is clearly speaking also to the one who is behind the king, the one perhaps responsible for his actions, who is the devil. But he says this, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God. And I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Now, I want you to notice that he says that, that Satan was in Eden. He was in the garden of God, and at the same time, he was on the mountain of God, which is described as heaven. When Lucifer fell and became the devil, he was cast off the mountain, he was cast out of heaven, and he landed in the garden in order that God might use him to bring Adam's probation to its conclusion. And of course, when Adam failed by disobeying God, he and Eve were cast out of the garden, and the garden or the paradise was taken off of the earth. But my point is that originally it appears as though in Eden, heaven and earth were actually combined together. God dwelt among his creatures, among his, um, well, uh, the, 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 the people that he had made, Adam and Eve. As we know, he came down in the cool of the evening uh, and he would fellowship with Adam and Eve. But once the probation ended, once Adam and Eve sinned, uh, that garden, that paradise of God was, was removed. And now the question is, where is it? Well, the only answer we find in Scripture is that it is up. <laughs> Remember when Jesus wanted to show John the things that would soon take place in 70 AD? He takes him up into heaven. We read in Revelation 4, verse 1, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. And he brought John into his heavenly council chambers in order that John might see 
he might receive, he might carry this message back to his church. You know, think about what Isaiah went through when the Lord was calling him to his prophetic office and Isaiah sees that vision of heaven and uh, of, of the glory of God and the train of God and the angels covering their faces and so forth, how he was lifted up into the heavenly council chambers of God to receive God's word to bring to the people. But again, these things are up. And this is also the direction Jesus went when he ascended. He went up. I remember John MacArthur one time was asked, where is heaven? He said, heaven is up. That's about the only thing we, we know about its location. So heaven and earth were once together, but now they've been separated. Now heaven is up and earth is, is considered below. And when our Lord Jesus Christ comes into the world, he descends into the depths of the earth. But he who, uh, who ascends is the one who has first descended. Again, this idea of this separation. But let's not forget why it is that our Lord Jesus Christ went up. Among other reasons, he went up in order that he might prepare a place for us in heaven. He says in the Upper Room Discourse in John 14, verses 1 through 3, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So this place that God originally created to be the habitation of, of the holy angels and to be the habitation of mankind is still there for us because of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ who has gone before us into heaven to prepare a place for us. As the author to the Hebrews reminds us in our meditation, heaven is where the spirits of righteous men and women dwell with God uh, forever, or at least in the intermediate state. Now, finally, let's think about what heaven is like now, the author to the Hebrews calls heaven a better country. I think you're familiar with that language in Hebrews 11, verses 13 through 16. Um, he says, all these died in faith. And here he's talking about those he's referred to up until this time, Abel and Enoch and to Abraham and so forth, without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, this word country that's, uh, that the author to the Hebrews uses here means homeland or, or hometown, okay? Uh, because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done, heaven is now our hometown, and it's a better hometown than any place that we have ever had on earth. Jesus calls it a paradise, Remember when, the, um, when he was speaking to the repentant thief on the cross, he says, and he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. And Paul uses the same word in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 3 and 4. So speaking of, of his admittance, again, Paul as well, into the, the council chamber of God in heaven, where he sees and hears things which really he, he couldn't utter as, as far as what he, what he saw and experienced. He says this, And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. Now we know that originally the Garden of Eden was this paradise where God and man could
could live together. Well, we know that paradise has been removed from earth because, uh, because of sin and because heaven and earth are now separate. So that paradise is now in heaven. And the reason why it is a paradise is because that is where the one that we desire the most actually dwells. Again, um, as um, Jim Lemon was reading for us, Psalm 73, um, in verse 25, we read this, uh, what Asaph says as the conclusion of everything that he was struggling with. You know, again, the desire to have what the rich have, you know, uh, the wealth and the no pains and everything you want and, and, and not to have the suffering he was going through. But when he considered the end of both, how the end of the, of the wealthy was going to be destruction, but the end of those who suffer for righteousness' sake will be heaven. He says this, Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. Well, God is what makes heaven to be heaven. God is what makes you know, heaven to be a paradise for us. Uh, again, the very radical uh, thing that the Puritans had to say on one occasion, and I forget which one, it was probably more than one, he said that I would rather be in hell, if that's where God is, than in heaven without him. Uh, because God and Christ, they're what make heaven heaven. They're what make it paradise. That's what made the original um, heaven on earth paradise uh, in, in Eden. And that's what makes, again, heaven to be paradise for us now. Well, that is the inheritance that Jesus has purchased for us. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. The author to the Hebrews calls this the eternal inheritance. And there the Bible tells us that we will enjoy the blessings of heaven, eternal rest for one thing. Remember how in Hebrews 4 verses 10 through 11, uh, the author to the Hebrews is arguing that our Lord Jesus Christ has entered into his rest. For the one who has entered into his rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. And that leaves the door open for us. It opens the door for us to be able to enter into heaven. He says, therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience as the you know, disobedient Jews did in the wilderness who did not believe God. We will enter into an eternal rest. Here we labor. Here there's that hard work of sanctification but also the hard work of advancing the kingdom of heaven. But when our work is done here, we enter into rest. There we will receive eternal glory. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, Paul says, For momentary light affliction, and he was probably referring to his own. And we say what he went through was, was horribly difficult, but he says that it's really just a momentary light affliction, even the very worst that we might have to experience is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. So there is eternal glory where we receive the reward for everything we have done for the Lord here on earth. And there we will have freedom from everything that ruins our happiness here. You know, none of the wicked shall enter into heaven Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.18, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. And again, we're reminded in the book of Revelation that no one, none of the wicked will ever enter into that holy city. There there will be, of course, no disease, suffering, no death. Revelation 21 verse 4, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. There will no longer be the struggle that we have to deal with, with the evil of our own hearts, right? That's one thing that we all 
look forward to. And we, we really read about that in our text, don't we? Actually, it was in our meditation. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. You see, in heaven, we will finally be perfected because that love that the Lord has given to us will finally reach perfection. Again, Paul writes in the passage that we're actually looking at in 1 Corinthians 13, I believe it's verse 10, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Now, how do we know that that is the perfect that is being referred to here? Well, it's because the Spirit of God is is called in Scripture the down payment of the inheritance. He's the one who gives to us that foretaste of heaven. We read in Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, In Him, as in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. So a pledge, a down payment, okay, a foretaste of what awaits us in heaven. And what is it that the Spirit of God gives to us that we experience? Well, love, okay, not only the love that we experience towards God, but also the experience of His love toward us, but that also gives to us that, as Peter calls it, joy unspeakable and full of glory. These are the things we experience through the Spirit of God, and we get just a foretaste of it here, but in heaven it will reach its perfection. In heaven, love will be perfected. Now, I can't help but point out something that Jonathan Edwards uh, points out <clears throat> as, you know, as something else I think of interest, and that is that we can experience that love and that joy, which we should be experiencing right now. I remember John Gerser saying one time, you can't imagine any Christian not experiencing joy, you know, joy in what the Lord has done for us. We should, we should be happy about that, you know, but we're going to experience that also when, um, when our bodies and our souls are separated during what, he would, what we call the intermediate state, okay? We can experience these things apart from our bodies. You know, Jonathan Edwards kind of turns over every stone when he's dealing with any issue. And here he was asking the question, well, you know, most of us today really uh, interpret our affections as the different things we experience bodily, you know, because when we have affections, they, they do cause sensations in our bodies. Uh, when, we, when we're guilty, we feel guilt. It's kind of like this wrenching sensation in our gut. Or when we love, we, we experience kind of a warmth, you know, in, inside of our, of, our, of, our, of our guts or in our chest. Uh, fear, we experience almost like a coldness or, or a trembling. And he says, sometimes we might mistake these sensations that we experience in our body as the affections themselves. But he says these affections are really in our souls. That's where they begin. And it's because our souls are connected with our bodies that we experience these sensations in the way that we do. But the, the, um, the important point is, is this, that when... We are in the intermediate state when our souls and bodies are separated. Not only will we still be able to experience affection, but we'll actually experience it much more powerfully, he says, because we will no longer have the flesh, we'll no longer have sin, the weakness of the body and the weakness of our sin to quench those affections. So when we die, and this is before the new heavens and the new earth when our souls are separated from our bodies and our souls go to heaven. Our love there will be 
perfect. Okay? We'll experience it in all of its fullness. We will finally love God and love the saints and love the angels as we have always wanted to love them in the way that Jesus loves them. The goal of our sanctification will have been reached. Okay? And this, again, the whole point of this was just simply, again, to remind us that Christianity is all about love. You know, it's, it's the, it's, we fell away from God, we fell into hatred and sin, but God restores us by giving His Spirit, giving us love, and He begins, um, again, moving us in that direction until it reaches its perfection in heaven. So that is what it is that we ought to be pursuing. You know, that's... That's what the Spirit of God is working in us. That's what He is moving us towards. That is what He desires for us. And so that's what we should be desiring. We should be pushing forward in seeking to love the Lord more. Not only that we might do more for Him here, but also that we might enjoy as much of heaven as we possibly can here on earth because it really is, is uh, you know, that experience of heaven is that love of which we have the foretaste from the Holy Spirit. The more He works in our hearts, the more we will experience that love and that joy unspeakable and full of glory. Well, let's, um, let's spend just a few moments in silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to, to use this to encourage us to push forward in our growth in, in grace and sanctification and love.